The last two topics, the search for political stability and religious conflict, are both short-term topics in Section A of Paper 1. That means you will have a question which focuses on a period of history of between 10 to 30 years. For example, the personal rule at Interregnum is a shorter period, or 1660 to 1685 for Charles II and Parliament. Topic 3, which deals with social and intellectual change, covers the whole breadth of the topic of 1625 to 1688, and sometimes for context we will diverge out of the time frame. If you need to do that in your essays, ensure you highlight it is for context only. The period 1625 to 1688 was a period of massive change, not just in religion, but also in social and economic issues. The gentry class, the precursor to the middle classes, starts to develop in Britain, along with a merchant class who also emerged, bringing an influx of doctors, lawyers and other professionals. The population of Britain begins its recovery from the Black Death a few hundred years before, and the growth of towns brings massive economic benefits to the population, and an agricultural revolution reversing the food shortages Britain has seen in the past. The role of women changed like a pendulum in the 17th century, bringing an increase in what women could do in the new restoration society. The extreme poverty seen in Britain from after the dissolution of the monasteries saw Elizabeth I's poor laws, meaning food rights were further between and the responsibility of caring for society became a civic duty. Then to capital, political ideas grew and by the end of the century the Age of Enlightenment was upon the Western world. The intention for this lecture is for you to be able to analyse how the change in population impacted on the urban and rural settings. To clarify, urban settings are cities and towns, and rural settings means the countryside. So any decision about town and country refers to the urban and rural areas. Knowledge-wise, you will be able to apply the impact of the Black Death in the 14th century on the Stuart era. Skills-wise, consider the impact of urban and rural change on the population. Behaviourally, you will assess the change in nature of demographics. Following the massive impact of the Black Death, which hit Britain in 1348, seeing one third of the population of Europe dying, and in Britain around one half of the population dead, the population stayed static until the Tudor era. From 1520 to 1680, the population of England doubled. As can be seen from the graph, in 1348 there was an indiscriminate eradication of life in Britain. A last and a serious consequence was the drastic reduction of the amount of land under cultivation due to the deaths of so many labourers. This proved to be the ruin of many landowners. The shortage of labour compelled them to substitute wages or money rents in place of labour services in an effort to keep their tenants. However, it is wrong to think that it was a completely negative event. There was also a general rise in wages for artisans and peasants. These changes brought a new fluidity to the hitherto rigid stratification of society. Between 1348 and the start of the Tudor reign in 1485, the population saw further outbreaks of plague. However, the Hundred Years' War with France and the Wars of the Roses also impacted on the population. Due to the long period of peace, by the start of the Stuart reign the population had recovered from the impact of the Black Death. However, its legacy remained and the improvements in the quality of life of peasants are reversed due to the inflation and the decline in the work available for the increase in population. In the 1650s, the tolerant policies of the Commonwealth and Protectorate attracted many migrants from Europe, escaping Catholic persecution. This saw the population grow, as well as the technological changes in the production of cloth and the agricultural method. There was also growth in the economic and internal migration of the English population, which of course has both positive and negative effects on the population and the economic viability of certain areas. In Barry Coward's The Stuart Age, it is stated that in a study of 206 witnesses before two church courts in Sussex between 1580 and 1650, concludes that over 75% of them no longer lived in their birthplaces. Most have moved only once and over short distances of up to 20 miles. This is important, as not only are these courts' records suggesting an increase in religious issues, we can also safely assume that criminal records will show the same thing. More importantly, people move to find work, marry or just to improve their lot in life. Coward continues, 
Long distance migration was more common among people at the upper and lower ends of the social spectrum. Wealthy landowners, merchants and the professional people and their families habitually travelled to London to take advantage of the many attractions of the capital. A consumer society, second homes were becoming the norm for more wealthy and better off in society. Whilst landless labourers, vagrants and unemployed young people travelled long distances in search of work. Therefore, there was a shortage of work, seasonal and longer term meaning the poor moved around. Between 1580 and 1640, poor migrants from all parts of Britain poured into three Kentish towns. There are reports of people walking from Yorkshire to Kent from 250 miles, some 10 days walk over dangerous terrain. Some travelled even further afield, migrated to Ireland or boarding ships at ports like Bristol, taking the Haddis' gamble of sailing to the newly established colonies in North America to become indentured servants. So not only were people migrating for religious reasons, it was also economic in nature too. The idea of indentured servitude is the contract between two individuals for someone to live and work off the debt of travel and subsistence to be able to start a new life. As the African slave trade grew, this option decreased for many poor individuals. As people in England began to feel more secure in their social economic situation, people tend to procreate more. And though disease was ever present, it was dealt with much better by isolation, for example. Fertility rates were also higher around 1650. However, from around 1650, people began to wait longer to get married. In 1600, most women married between 26 and 24, meaning if they remained fertile in 240, they could give birth 15 times. However, 1650, that age had reduced to 28 to 26, reducing the possible offspring by two. This explains the change in the population. It is even more evident when you look at the difference between birth and death rates in England. As the population grew and death rates decreased, so did the birth rates. Around the middle of the 17th century, London became the largest city in Western Europe, fed by the Thames and its ability to trade from its inland position. In 1520, 2.25% of the population of England lived in London. By 1700, this had grown to 9% of the population, between 400,000 to 500,000 people, making London more than 10 times bigger than the next largest English towns of Bristol and Norwich. London's growth was rapid both in terms of the economy, with the wealth of the city and its importance in the growing global trade, and in terms of the population, with almost 10% of the population in the city by the end of the 17th century. London's explosion of a metropolitan centre of commerce and culture was assured. Many historians believe that the Stuart economy and the successes of the fledgling empire was due to the explosion of London. Without the power and opportunities offered by London, the very existence of the future British Empire is in doubt. Nevertheless, the impact of London on its future can be overplayed, as the goal of its growth was not the development of a global empire. Its growth was the result of social, economic and cultural developments which encouraged migration and the development of new opportunities for Londoners. London was a beacon of possibility which attracted people to its opportunities. As such, a local economy of market gardens developed. A market garden is a small-scale farm, normally on the outskirts of an urban area, when the produce is grown for sale. In the late 17th century, many market gardens developed outside London, feeding its ever-growing population. A big debate is whether London's growth would have happened if it was not for the local economy which developed around London to feed the population. Did the population grow because of the infrastructure around London, or did the infrastructure grow to support the growing population? The maps show how the distribution of towns changed over the 17th century. On the left are all the towns with a population of over 5,000 in 1603. On the right, the towns with a population over 5,000 in 1714. In 1603, Newcastle had a population of 10,000, and by 1714, the population had grown to 12,000 with a concentration on the coal industry. Like Newcastle, York saw a population grow from 10,000 to 12,000. Norwich also saw a growth, however this was much larger. 
In 1603, Norwich had a population of 10,000, and by 1714, its population had exploded to 30,000, including large numbers of Dutch migrants concentrating on the growing cloth industry in Norfolk. The cloth and textile manufacturing also impacted on Ipswich, with a population growth of 4,000 in 1600 to 7,500 in 1680. Manufacturing also impacted on other towns as well. In the north, which saw a growth in livestock farming in comparison to agriculture in the southeast, Chester's manufacturing of leather goods saw the population grow from 4,600 in 1563 to 7,100 in 1664. Also, as the population grew, migration and trade with the colonies in the New World and trade with the Indies in India catapulted towns like Liverpool and Bristol to become industrial centres processing the importing and exporting of trade. In Britain, the economy was dominated by the agricultural industry, closely followed by the cloth-related industries, which were central to Ipswich and Norwich. For example, Gloucestershire in the census of 1608 had half the population involved in other professions rather than agriculture, mostly the cloth trade. Its importance can be seen in the amount of land in England which was devoted to the agricultural industry, around 9 million acres, around 30% of England. The majority of crops were wheat for bread and barley for beer. In the first half of the century, it was relatively easy for farmers to make a profit as the population was increasing. However, after 1650, inflation meant that many smaller farms were unable to reinvest the dwindling profits back into the farm to grow production. They had little to no option but to sell on their farms. As a result, more farmland came under the control of wealthy landowners and gentry who had the capital to invest in the new methods of agriculture, which we will look at in a future lecture. As more farms were owned by a single individual, and as the population grew, more farms merged and focused on single crops on livestock. The focus on single crops using new technologies had the benefits of greater yields reducing the cost to purchase these crops. This drive for efficiency pushed more small farmers out of the markets. As the towns in England grew, which saw by 1701 15% of the population in towns, a growth of 3% of the century before, new infrastructure was required to move the produce of agriculture to the markets in towns. Investment in roads, the first toll road in 1662, and improvements in rivers and canals saw massive improvements in the transportation of goods in England. The intention for this lecture was for you to be able to analyse how the change in population impacted on the urban and rural settings. Knowledge-wise, you have seen how the Black Death in the 14th century impacted on the Stuart era. Skills-wise, consider the impacts of urban and rural change on the population. And behaviourally, you need to assess the changing nature of demographics. Now complete the associated material.